Well, hello everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again, even though, again today, it's only in a virtual way. do really miss seeing all of you face to face, but we are grateful for the technology that we have so that we can provide worship services and hopefully encouragement from God's Word. I hope and trust that all of you are doing well, been able to see some of you and a few of you have been able to see, see through our Zoom Sunday School class and uh, the Zoom prayer meeting. Speaking of the Sunday School class, we will continue to have the uh, Zoom Sunday School class Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock. So uh, feel free to join us. Kathy Long uh, graciously is serving as our administrator and host. So we welcome you to the class if you're free on Sunday afternoons at 4 also wanted to let everyone know that we are seeking to move toward live streaming our Sunday morning worship service so that you can see it live on Sunday morning at 11. It won't happen tomorrow, uh, or actually today is actually Friday, but it won't happen uh, Sunday, May 31st, but we're hoping possibly we can do live streaming on uh, June 7th. <clears throat> so please pray that the Lord would help to make that possible. The service also will be recorded if you wanted to see it later in the day or at a different time. Well, let's pray and seek God's blessing as we worship him this day. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we come before you to ascribe to you the glory that is due to your holy name. You are wonderful in your counsel and mighty in all of your works. You have created all things by the word of your power, and indeed all things are your servants. You have redeemed us who believe by the precious blood of your Son, our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And through faith in Christ we are reconciled to you and have a relationship with you which shall never end. Therefore, we praise you from our hearts. Uh, we ask that you would graciously draw near to us and reveal yourself to us as we worship you this day. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Steve and Janice Swire will now lead us in a hymn, and we thank them so much for their ministry of music to us.
Thank you, Steve and Janice, for leading us in the worship of God through that hymn. We are so grateful for your ministry to us. We have a reading which you can uh, join with me on. It is the Apostles' Creed, a familiar and historical creed uh, in the church. Let us confess our faith together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May God bless these wonderful truths of the gospel to our minds and hearts as we worship him this day. Let's again join together as we pray to God. I will lead us in prayer as we bring to him our burdens and our requests. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, what a delight it is to come to you in prayer and to draw near to you by faith in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the glorious God who has created all things and rules over all things. And you have made us for yourself that we might find our rest in you. We praise you that you have given us all things richly to enjoy. We do thank you for your many mercies to us, for your bountiful provision in our lives, and especially for the gift of salvation through your Son, Jesus. Christ has poured himself out for us and for our redemption, and through Jesus, the certificate of debt of our sins, which was against us, has been taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. And truly, the blood of Christ cleanses us of all of our sins. We thank you for forgiving us and for accepting us through Christ, and we praise you for the fellowship that we have with you. May you be the great treasure and joy and delight in our lives. Father, we confess our many sins to you. We are guilty of breaking your laws and falling short of your glory. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us a gift of repentance that we might turn from our sins and might walk in holy obedience through the power of the Spirit within us. Help us to love you with all of our hearts and our neighbor as ourselves. And may we find great joy in laboring in your kingdom and seeing you glorified through the spreading of the gospel. And Father, we do pray for the needs we see in friends and family members, co-workers and neighbors all around us. We pray for those who are sick and who battle physical illness or weakness or infirmity. We pray for their healing, for their uh, encouragement, for you to draw near to them and prov provide for all of their needs. We pray for those who have financial and economic needs, uh, that you would give to them out of your bountiful supply, your riches and glory in Christ. We pray that those who are unemployed might find jobs and that they would receive from the provision that you give us as we trust and rely upon you. Thank you for your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, we pray about ongoing concerns about the pandemic of COVID-19. We pray that you would protect lives from contracting this disease. We pray that you would bless medical workers as, uh, and doctors as they serve those who are sick. And we pray that medical researchers could be given insight from you as to the development of treatment medicines for the coronavirus and also 
a vaccine which will uh, protect people from the disease. Uh, Father, we pray that the gospel would advance during these very unusual times, uh, even though we are just now beginning to regather somewhat, yet those who are vulnerable to the illness must continue to quarantine themselves. Father, we pray that many would come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and that by whatever means you see fit, uh, people would uh, be converted and brought into your kingdom. Show us what we can do to make the light and knowledge of Christ known to those around us. We praise you and bless you for your protection, for your mercies, for your provision in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have another hymn, and again, the swires will lead us in the worship of God through singing. Janice, thank you again for leading us in the worship of God through the singing of that hymn. My scripture text for my message today comes from Matthew's gospel. It is a familiar passage, Matthew 11, verses 25 through 30. This is God's word. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. May God bless to our minds and hearts this reading of his word. Let us pray together. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds from this powerful passage of scripture. We pray that we would be more and more drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ, your son. May we delight in his beauty, his grace, and his love, and may we be zealous to make him known to others. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the negative effects of the pandemic and economic shutdown that we are experiencing these days is the toll that it can take on people's mental health. There is much stress that is caused by all of this for many people, those who fear getting the disease or those who have suffered economic loss from losing their job or seeing their investments go down. Likely, many have anxiety and have very little peace in life. Well, this passage teaches us, along with other similar passages of Scripture, that only God gives true peace, and this peace is found through a faith relationship with his Son, Jesus Christ. The theme for my message this morning is enjoy spiritual peace through Jesus Christ. And I'd like for us to consider two principles which should motivate us to have spiritual peace through Christ. The first principle is found in verses 25 through 27. God is only known through revelation from Christ. We need to consider the context of this passage, especially the preceding context. In chapter 10, we note that the context is a context of unbelief. In chapter 10, Jesus gives the missions discourse, and in this discourse, he emphasizes the opposition that exists in the world against Christ and also against his followers. And then in Matthew 11, verse 3, we see the context of unbelief continued as even John the Baptist, while he is in prison, had doubts about Christ. John was the forerunner of Jesus and pointed him out to the crowds. And yet now even he is saying, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? And then in Matthew 11, verse 20, it speaks of the cities in Galilee, Chorazin and Capernaum and others in which Jesus' miracles had occurred. And yet they didn't repent and Jesus pronounces judgment upon them for their great unbelief. A widespread mindset likely could have been, uh, was Jesus failing in his ministry since there was so much unbelief directed toward him? Is he not the Savior after all? Is his gospel untrue? Well, we also can face the same temptation as we look at different segments of our culture and society and see growing unbelief and spiritual apathy and hardness of heart. Well, it could be easy to be discouraged when we don't see the gospel advancing the way we would like to see it. But this passage encourages us, don't be discouraged because Conversion to Christ is not from human achievement or from human wisdom. We note in verse 27, the truth emphasized that Christ is the divine mediator. Jesus, far from being disheartened by these sad results, instead rejoices in what he sees to be his father's good pleasure in the parallel passage to this passage in Luke uh, chapter 10, verse uh, 21, it says that Jesus at this time rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. Here in Matthew 10, uh, excuse me, Matthew 11, verses 25 through 27, we get a glimpse 
of Jesus' consciousness of his own identity as the Son of God, and also his thoughts about how the plan of salvation is being worked out uh, through his Father's will. In exalted and elevated language, Jesus declares himself to be the divine Son of God, implying that he is the second person of the Trinity, that he has all power and authority and divine prerogative. He says that all things have been handed over to him by the Father. And this all things does refer to all of his divine rights and privileges as the Savior and King of the world. But especially in this context, the all things likely emphasizes his divine knowledge and also his divine prerogative to reveal knowledge about God. For he alone fully and uniquely knows God the Father. This truth is also spoken of in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 18, where it says that no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Only through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ can God be known, for Jesus is God, the divine Son of God. Colossians 2.9 says that in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. And in 1 John 2.23 it says, He who denies the Son does not have the Father, but he who confesses the Son has the Father as well. And 1 Timothy 2.5 says that Jesus is the only mediator between God and men. Therefore, we can only know God and approach God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, believe in Jesus Christ, worship him, seek God through him, and learn about God through Jesus Christ and in his person. Because there is no other way for you to rightly know God and to have a relationship with him. C.S. Lewis, in his book, God in the Dock, said this about Christ's claims to be divine. Lewis wrote, He went about saying to people, I forgive your sins. Now it is quite natural for a man to forgive something you do to him. Thus, if somebody cheats me out of five pounds, it is quite possible and reasonable for me to say, Well, I forgive him. We will say no more about it. But what on earth would you say if someone had stolen five pounds from you, and yet I said, that's all right, I forgive him? Well, this is what Jesus did, because he is God, and God alone has the prerogative to forgive. So also Jesus here is saying that he alone rightly knows God and reveals God. But then we note also in these verses qualities about the recipients of Jesus' revelation. Verse 27 uh, does teach that we come to know God only through Jesus Christ and through his divine initiative in revealing God and not through human wisdom or human intelligence. Paul makes this same point in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 21, where he says, In the wisdom of God, the world did not come to know God through its wisdom. Well, why is it the case that the world cannot come to know God through human wisdom? Well, Paul answers this in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually uh, discerned. Hence, we see why it is the case that not many mighty or noble or wise people are in the church. Matthew eleven twenty six. For such was well-pleasing in God's sight. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, and following, it says that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and he's chosen the weak things of the world to shame uh, the strong, and that 
Uh, it is of him, uh, verse uh, 30, that you are in Christ Jesus, so that no flesh should boast before God, but instead let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. God wants to humble the pride of man, and he wants to magnify his own grace uh, and power in saving lost sinners. Saving knowledge of God comes through Jesus Christ and him revealing it to lowly and needy sinners who rely completely upon him for salvation and for reconciliation with God. So turn to Christ in humble faith. Depend only on him for the forgiveness of your sins and for a close relationship with God and rely on Christ for a deep experience of God's love and grace and goodness and use scripture and prayer to draw near to him and to feed uh, your soul. Florence Nightingale said about her amazing life, she said, I am an ordinary woman of very ordinary abilities. I have been led by God and used by him in unusual ways. When I look at my life, I conclude that God has done all and I nothing. And Hudson Taylor, at the end of his life, was very weak, and he said, I am so feeble, I cannot work. I cannot converse. I can't even read my Bible. I can only lie still in God's arms like a little child and trust. And so also we are to trust in Christ for right knowledge of God and nearness to him, and also trust Christ to make the, uh, God known to others as we share the gospel with unchurched and unsaved people. And that's the first principle to help us enjoy spiritual peace through Jesus Christ. God is only known through revelation from Christ. The second principle is found in verses 28 through 30, and it is going to Christ in faith brings spiritual rest. In these verses, 28 through 30, we find how we are to go to Christ. There are three imperative mood verbs uh, in these verses. The first command verb is come. Jesus says, come to me. He invites anyone who wants to know God and draw near to him, who wants to receive God's blessing to come to him, that is to come to Jesus, for he is the divine son and savior and mediator between God and man. He is the only one who reveals true saving knowledge of God. If you come to Christ, you come to God. This coming to Christ does involve believing truths about Christ, but it's also coming to him as a person. It's having a relationship with God through having a relationship with the living person, Jesus Christ. Have you done this? Have you trusted in Christ? And do you have a relationship with him? And do you come to him on a regular basis uh, through prayer, reading his word, worship, and service? Christ wants us to come to him. But then also another imperative mood verb is take my yoke upon you. This is a metaphor for the discipline of discipleship. It's connecting yourself to Christ as his disciple and submitting to his authority and to his commands. Yes, responsibilities are involved in being yoked to Christ as his uh, disciple. But even more so, there are great blessings involved in being yoked to this glorious person. Have you done this? Are you yoked to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in relationship with him? And then the third verb, uh, the third command we find in these verses is learn, learn from me. And especially he's talking about learning about God, learning how to have a relationship with him 
and grow in that relationship uh, with him uh, as well. There is great blessing, and God wants to, us to learn about him through our relationship with Jesus Christ, for he alone can teach us the truth about God and give us the highest knowledge possible, that is, knowledge about the glorious God. And through this knowledge, he transforms our lives. Once there was an ad in a big city, a famous violinist was going to play a concert on a famous violin, a $10,000 violin. Well, the date arrived and the theater was packed, and he played a beautiful concert. But at the end, shockingly, he threw the violin on the floor and smashed it to pieces with his foot. He left the stage, the audience was stunned, and then shortly afterwards came back onto the stage and played more music, this time on the actual $10,000 violin. The violin which he played at first and which he smashed was a $20 cheap violin. But nevertheless, he had still played great music on it. So also the Lord Jesus Christ can play great music through any life that is devoted to him as he transforms us into the image of God and makes us into the persons God intends for us to be. But that's how we are to go to Christ, coming to him, taking his yoke upon us, and learning about God from him. But the passage also gives us incentives for going to Christ. For one thing, the invitation is extended to those who are laboring or who are weary and burdened. In the historical context, those who are laboring and burdened are likely Jews who are burdened by the legalism of the scribes and Pharisees who gave cumbersome, multiplied requirements that no one could fully meet and left no one with a clear conscience. So the Jews of Jesus' day were indeed spiritually burdened and weary because they could not keep the legalistic laws of the Pharisees. But this imagery of being weary and burdened extends more broadly to all people who feel themselves to be burdened by sin, burdened by sin's guilt and power and bondage, and by the negative effects of sin in one's own life and in broken relationships with others. Our son Joseph told us the story how at basic training with the Marines, he made a mistake and they disciplined him or punished him by making him carry an 80-pound can of ammo along with his normal nearly 100-pound rucksack as they went through the exercises the next day. And so he's crawling through sand and going through swamps and climbing obstacles with all this weight on him, so that by the end of the day, he was thoroughly exhausted. Well, this is what Jesus has in mind. Those who are worn out by being distressed and tormented by sin, they should seek relief in Christ. In Matthew 9, 12, he invites those who are sick through their sins to come to him, the great physician, for healing. Well, healing and salvation are found nowhere else than in Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 48, 21 and 57, 21, it says, There is no peace, peace, saith the Lord, for the wicked. Well, peace is found only in Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 24, By his wounds we are healed. But then another incentive for coming to Christ is that he is gentle and humble in heart. He is not a harsh taskmaster. Isaiah 42, 3, which speaks of the coming Messiah and says of him that a bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. Jesus is tender and forgiving. He is full of love and compassion and encouragement towards his disciples.
disciples. He is the perfect master and Lord. He considers us his friends, and he is our servant leader, having served us by dying on the cross for our sins. So come to this one who is gentle and humble and loving in heart. And then another incentive is that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now it's somewhat ironic that he says his yoke is easy and his burden is light because viewed from one perspective, uh, discipleship with Jesus is very demanding, even more demanding than that discipleship of the Pharisees. For Jesus said in Matthew 5, 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew 6, 24, speaking of discipleship, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That is, be willing to engage not only in self-denial, but even giving up our lives for Christ. But nevertheless, it still is true that his yoke is easy and his burden is small and light because Christ conveys to us love and grace and also empowerment through the Holy Spirit uh, to delight in as well as obey his commands. 1 John 5, 3 says that his uh, commands are not burdensome. And the essence of Christ's commands are to love God and to love man. And through the Spirit, he gives us a growing desire uh, to do so. Once there was a father who was carrying a heavy basket, and his young son wanted to help him with the basket. So the dad allowed him, but he got a five-foot-long sturdy pole and put it through the handle of the basket and put the basket right next to his hand on one end of the pole and the young son at the other end of the pole. So in reality, the father was bearing nearly all the weight of the basket. This is what Jesus does for us in having borne the burden of our sins and empowering us to carry out and fulfill his love commands. Well, that's incentives for going to Christ. Let's look at what the passage says about the result of going to Christ, and that is spiritual rest. The result is spiritual rest. It says uh, in both 28 and 29 that if we go to Christ, he will give us rest. We will find rest for our souls. This is a quote from Jeremiah chapter 6, verse uh, 16. Uh, which says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. Here we learn that the ancient paths and the good way of the Old Testament culminate and find fulfillment in Christ. That is, through faith in Christ and discipleship to him, all the te teaching of the Old Testament finds its fulfillment, and we find true rest for our souls, uh, a relationship with God only through being yoked with Christ. This concept of spiritual rest occurs also in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, uh, verse 1 and 3. In Hebrews 4, 1, it says, While a promise of his rest remains, let us make sure that no one falls short of it. In verse 3 of Hebrews 4, it says that uh, rest is experienced by those who believe uh, in Christ. So this rest refers to a state of salvation. It refers to the forgiveness of our sins and being reconciled to God, being at peace uh, with him and thus having his peace in our hearts, no longer laboring for acceptance with God through our own good works, but resting in the finished work of Christ. Well, do you know this rest through faith in Christ? 
Do you have the peace of God that passes all understanding? Well, turn to Christ in faith. Devote yourself uh, to Christ and follow him. Experience his grace and his goodness and his peace. Also, during these difficult and troubled times, help others to believe in Christ and to have his peace as well. May God use us during these days to not only know his peace in a deeper way and to rest in him, but also to help others rest in Christ through faith in his finished work who have never trusted in him or perhaps who have drifted away from him. May God use us as his instruments of blessing in our troubled and sinful world. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful truths of this passage. And I pray that we would truly know you through our faith relationship with Jesus Christ. And may we experience the rest and peace that this passage speaks of. May we find joy and satisfaction in our relationship with you through faith in your Son. And Father, also motivate us and give us open doors uh, to share the peace of Christ with others as you give us opportunity to share the gospel with those who have not yet trusted in him. This we pray for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom in Christ's name.